Welcome to Deeds and Dragons. I thought this was going to be hard. <laughs> Welcome to Deeds and Dragons. Who wants some of the Ripper? Fair state champs, baby. Woo! Smile, Perry! He just completely kept it. I'm a man of the people. Shattered world. Ripper, no! And welcome to another episode of the DeejCast, the supplemental podcast for our YouTube show, Deejes and Dragons. And hey, you guys can see us this time. You know why? This is a special edition, a video edition of the DeejCast. We're talking to a very special guest today, and I thought this kind of warranted a format change, you know, at least for this episode. Maybe we'll do some more in the future if this works out well. But before we get into all of that, let's set the stage. I am your host, Nate Lindbergh, and you can find me on Twitter at Nate Lindbergh. You can follow our brand on Twitter, uh, at, uh, Twitter, Facebook, and most importantly, YouTube at Deej Time. That's D-E-G-E-T-I-M-E. And as always, joining me today, we have the person whose hair began growing longer as mine began falling out. Coincidence? You tell me, folks. He is the permanent member of our player panel and veteran RPG gamer, Tony Shremuxnes. Oh, you found out my deep, dark secret, Nate. That's, that's <laughs> I, why we're really friends. See, see, you know what? I mean, when, when we met, when we met, I had hair. I had hair. Now I don't. Now I don't. Yours got longer. And I don't, I don't know. I blame you. I think you have something to do with it. It yeah. seems like some weird hair wizard, like, you know, like a cow lich or something. You know, it's like some something weird. Something like that. You know. I've, it's been in the back of my mind for about 10 years now. Yeah, just saying, mm. just saying. Now, speaking of hair, let's introduce the one person whose facial hair could actually rival mine in the sixth grade. And yes, before you asked, we both rocked mutton chops in sixth grade when we were just young kids on bikes ourselves. Was, our, <laughs> was it fourth grade? God, man, I was given, you know what? You gave us more credit than I did. He's our resident technology, uh, sorry, not technology. I'm the technology no. guy. He's our resident <laughs> psych psychology and therapy expert, Connor Dodette. <laughs> Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> and without further ado, let's introduce a man who's already taken what we're aiming to do, showcase the benefits of RPG uh, gaming and therapy, and put it into practice long before Deejas and Dragons was even a thought in the neurons of Conrad's brain piece. He is the co-founder of the Bud Hunter Group, Jack Birkenstock. Jack, thank you very much for being here, and welcome to the DeejCast. Oh, I, absolutely. Thank you for having me. It's, uh, this, this has been uh, excitement building up this, uh, this entire week. Uh, thank you for having me on, and, and thank you additionally for drawing, you know, kind of increased attention to, you know, a, a segment of people that may not consider this normally, you know, this whole approach of using narrative role-playing games for, you know, therapeutic intentionality. Uh, so I guess, I guess just kind of a brief, you know, I'm, a, I'm not only the executive director, I'm also one of the founders of Bodana. Um, we have been around since 2009. Uh, we started out as a training consultation firm for uh, what most of my professional experience has been working with children and teens in residential, adjudicated, and community based settings. Uh, I also spent a lot of time working with adults with disability in community settings. My specialty is working with um, persons who exhibit sexually problematic behaviors as well as victims of sexual abuse and trauma. Uh, so that I've been doing for, uh, I'd say, the better part of about 20 years. And then Bodan, of course, for the last 11 years, where we kind of took some of our experience of running role-playing back in the day in, in the facility, and I, I'll probably get into that in a little bit, um, basically just learning to use this in a way that is impactful, insightful, but uh, never forgets the fun because that's kind of one of the most essential pieces is, is the game itself. Uh, so again, I'm a master's level therapist. I got my degree in 08 uh, in human services from Lincoln University. And uh, like I said, pretty much since then, we've been uh, putting all this together. And I'll talk a little bit about, you know, our Save Against Fear convention that we run every year as our fundraiser, professional trainings we offer, uh, and of course, also uh, uh, Wizards, Warriors, and Wellness and our research project, which is getting off the ground as we speak. So I got, I got a lot to talk about and, uh, and, I, and I, you know, I hope, uh, hope I don't bore anybody. You know what? I don't think you will. I don't think you will. We've all, I know the three of us have been extremely excited to have you on the show. Uh, so I think, uh, I think we're going to be glued to whatever you have to say. You've got an attentive audience. That's what I, that's, that's, I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> Before we really uh, kick off. So, 
you know, how did how did the Badhana group be uh, you know, get formed? How did it come to uh, come to be? Well, it, uh, very interesting story. We, uh, the founders of Bodana had all worked together at a juvenile placement facility in Ephrata, Pennsylvania, uh, oh, so many years ago. And <clears throat> we had all worked on the sexually problematic behaviors unit, either the pre-adolescent or the adolescent unit. And uh, the facility, in the wake of a lot of other facilities, kind of going away from that, you know, adjudicated residential treatment model to a more community-based outpatient model, uh, our facility shut down in February of 2009. So here we are, we're a ton of people with a skill set that and we're not really doing residential facilities anymore. So sorry for all that training, but you know, so we, we actually started trying to say, well, we have all this experience working with this type of behavior, which is a very difficult demographic, uh, not only for the treatment itself, but also like, you know, talking about what it does and how it impacts the, the providers and the people who do this kind of treatment. So we first started trying to do like training and consultation on things like vicarious trauma and compassion fatigue and helping, uh, uh, different companies set up programs to deal with this unique behavior. And we kind of found out after a couple of years that training budgets were kind of like drying up and folks are like, well, you know, the model is more based in residential and we're not doing that anymore. So thanks, but no thanks. So we were all sitting around going, hashtag nonprofit needs money. So what are we going to do? Right. Um, <clears throat> so at that point, we had the idea that, you know, none of us were really golfers. We didn't have a car to auction off. So let's run a fundraiser. What were we all? 75% uh, of us were gamers. So we figured even though we had never actually attended a game convention, we started Save Against Fear at a local game store called 60 to Under Games. And uh, so the first year was like 35 people. It was basically the store's regulars who came out and said, man, this is cool. And uh, uh, honestly, the reason we picked Save Against Fear as a name was we wanted people to kind of use the concept of a saving throw. And we wanted to save against, you know, make your saving throw against that fear to open up about sexual abuse. To If you see something, say something. If if you yourself have, have suffered sexual abuse or trauma, you know, open up to someone about it, whether it be a friend, whether it be a professional. So it was partnered with uh, another event we ran at the time called Meeples and Peoples Against Abuse, which was our board game functioned event. Um, <clears throat> that year, Rich Thomas, uh, formerly of White Wolf and currently uh, of Onyx Path Publishing, uh, actually he's in Pennsylvania. So he came to Save Against Sphere and we were all like, oh my God, the vampire guys like at our event. This is amazing. You know, so we were all like, hee hee. That, we were that's all incredible. Like, yeah, it was, it was amazing. And so, in it, and I always talk about this, like we had a conversation on the phone one day before Save had happened. And he was telling us about all the letters over the years that they had received at uh, White Wolf about people role playing in the world of darkness setting and how, you know, people were using the fight against the monsters in the game as kind of like a metaphor and allegory about fighting the monsters and, and, and the darkness that they had experienced in their lives. So they were getting empowered through the playing of these characters and the defeat of all of these, you know, adversaries and villains. And... It, I kind of call this like my Blues Brothers moment, you know what I mean? We're like, you know, the, the, the clouds parted and the light shone down on me in my Toyota Corolla and on the side of the road talking to Rich and I'm just like, oh my God, we're all playing games. So, so then after I had my giddy ooey moment, uh, it was, hey guys, we're all therapists and we actually used the game on the unit years ago more recreationally, but even then we saw, you know, like, at first, it was like, hey, Johnny, don't blow it. You're our cleric, and we're gaming on Saturday, so don't get off level. Like, you need to keep it together because otherwise, we're screwed. So, you know, at first, kids who wouldn't talk to each other were – striking up these friendships and these accords with each other based on the games. We were like, okay, on a surface level, the game is a language, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a system of engagement. But then we started examining our own gamer hobby and what it meant to us at certain moments in our lives. You know, myself, I, I got through, you know, a, a messy family situation, parents getting divorced, a lot of strife there. And I was kind of like hanging out in the lurch while they fought things out. So, you know, gaming was my way 
<clears throat> of exploring identity. It enhanced my creativity. It, uh, I was actually a very shy, introverted child when I was younger. I kept to myself. I didn't bother anybody. So gaming did a lot for me in that aspect. One of our founders got through the death of his mother uh, from cancer at a young age um, through gaming. So we analyzed gaming as the self and what it did for us. And then we started to say, well, now let's take like that big, you know, jeweler's lens that you see in movies, you know, and let's focus this through the therapist's eye and see, well, okay, we run groups as RPG and we run groups for therapy. So that just cascaded down into us developing a theoretical model at first. And we were kind of looking at how we could connect the dots between things like psychodrama and rational mode of behavioral therapy and narrative and expressive therapies. Uh, and we found that there were even something as simple as cognitive behavioral therapy. I mean, let's analyze that choice you made. Like, do you want to go rushing into the room at the archers again? How'd that work out? You know, getting all Dr. Phil about it, you know, like, how'd oh, yeah. that work out for you? Um, <laughs> so the, yep. the, that started a long ride and, and Save Against Fear is more than just a fundraiser for us. It's, it's an annual game convention we run that is now the platform that we use for gathering professionals together to share stories about what they've been doing in the industry in their practice and to connect therapists with game designers and industry leaders to let them know, hey, we're using your games for this purpose now. So let's maybe talk about getting intentional with design. And, you know, we've, we've partnered, I actually wrote a, a thing called Parents and Kids on Bikes for the free content Friday for uh, Renegade Game Studios for Kids on Bikes. Um, so we, we've done a lot with that. And over the years, we, we've just added so much that has now led us to designing our own role-playing game for therapeutic intentionality, um, doing a research project. So, I mean, it's, it's a long road over the last 10 years of Save Against Fear, but it has added so much to, to the way we look at this and, and the stories we hear that give us, you know, different ideas. So it, that's kind of, I, I guess it's not really a short version of the story of Bodana, um, but, you know, now we run private pay groups. We run services for agencies. We also do training and consultation for professionals. So we, we run a, a wide array of services um, that all, you know, center around the use of tabletop gaming in general. So we also offer board game programs uh, in addition to using narrative role playing. So this is kind of the, the centerpiece of what we do. And I'll talk a little bit later on about, you know, if you would like to support us and, and the mission that we have, different ways that folks can do that. So that, that I guess covers most, most of the bases on that question. <laughs> oh, I mean, very, uh, very, very well, very well. And, and I, I, uh, I swear you must have my list of questions up because the next one was about <laughs> Save Against <laughs> Fear. I, well, I could go into more detail if you'd like. Um, well, you know, I, I kind of just wanted to talk a little bit about like the, you know, the, the format of Save Against Fear. You know, I know, um, you know, the three of us, we've been to conventions in the past. You know, personally, I've been to PAX and I've been to, you know, Comic-Con. Um, so, you know, I know you've got, you know, with those, you've got giant, you know, booths and you've got all these crazy <laughs> screens and all this all over the place. And I know when, um, you know, uh, last, uh, or I don't know, it was a few, a few days ago, um, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, off camera, off air, just kind of. Um, you know, introducing ourselves to get to know each other. You, you, I know you mentioned that uh, save the fear. You know, you, no screens. There's only I think you said two vendors that allow, you know are allowed to even have technology and screens. So I just kind of wanted to talk about you know what the what the atmosphere is like and and, sure. and all that because that, that that whole analog uh, the analog feel is just really cool to me. Well, it was one of the things that kind of kind of early on, like we, we know that there are role playing games in many formats, right? You know, we, we don't just have tabletop or analog role playing games. We also have JRPG or Japanese role playing games. We have, you know, MMORPGs and MUDs and like all of these different versions of RPG. So a lot of people are kind of like, well, do we want to like, you know, do we want to have a Smash Brothers tournament? And and I literally I kind of sat back and said, why? Like there are other, we don't need that. Like that's another that's another thing that just I think kind of detracts from, you know. And I'm not going to go down that you know like old man on a rant thing about kids and screens and how you know no one talks anymore. No, I'm so mad. <clears throat> um, 
<laughs> but it, it was the idea that our, the experience that we want to have at Save Against Fear is we do want to focus on the fact that at the basic core level, this hobby is about getting people together and about, you know, getting people connected with each other, whether it's something as simple as a board game that you've never played before. So you have like those created memorable moments, right? Like our whole lives are narrative. So our whole lives about creating stories and how we connect to each other. Cause there's even that thing that we learn about our brain where, you know, hindsight is never 2020. It, it is augmented with, with as many lenses as you could possibly conceive because we tell these stories and then based on how they respond, you know, people that listen to these stories, we change the narrative and it changes how, you know, when I tell you about that first time I was on stage when I was in first grade in that, you know, dance into Copacabana, true story, um, you know, over the, the years. Copa, yeah, Copa exactly. I, actually, weird side note, that's a horrible song if you ever listen to the end of it because it's the whole like, it, it, uh, like just Lola sitting alone, like it's a disco, not for Lola with faded, uh, faded feathers in her hair or something. It, it, it's like she sits there so refined and drinks herself half blind. So it's like, <laughs> this is horrible. Like this is not, and everybody's like, you, you know, know if we're, we're going to go, if we're going to go on a, uh, go on a tangent, I'm going to go on a tangent myself. There's, um, there's a, they're not on the air anymore, but there was a very popular Boston radio duo by the name of Lauren and Wally. Um, they, uh, I, for like, I think it was 38 years. They were, um, they were on the air for, uh, in the morning. And, uh, I mean, from when I was a kid, I, I'm talking like probably first grade up until they went off the air just last year. Um, I listened to them and they, one of their biggest things was creating parody songs. And they created a parody song of the Copacabana about a local, um, adult gentleman's establishment in the area uh, okay. called, called the golden banana. Um, and yeah, that real place, Saugus, 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 Massachusetts, real place. And um, it, uh, it definitely takes that song and brings it to a whole different level. <laughs> Okay, well, I have my Google homework for this afternoon. Uh, I, <laughs> it's uh, it, it. I mean, it's it's still relative. I mean, it's still relatively like PG. I mean, my parents let me listen to it when I was a kid, right? But um, you know, but no, it, it you're, you're just saying it, the 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 meaning and the lyrics of that song. It just reminded me of all. Oh no, that oh my gosh, know. no, I I'm si sincerely going to check that out. Um. So I, I guess fo focusing back on the uh, – so when we talk about the format of Save Against Fear, we wanted to create uh, the con that we wanted to attend, you know, like everybody talks about. And Because, I mean, I, I, I've been to Gen Con. I've been to PAX Unplugged. I've been to MAGFest. I've been, you know, to Awesome Con in D.C. You know, all great environments, but it, it – and I used to sometimes kind of make the reference that a lot of Comic-Cons I go to, I'm like kind of standing around. I'm like, it's a flea market. Like it's a, it's a flea market with a bunch of uh, special guests, like, you know, cutting the ribbon on the opening of the local Popeyes or something, you know what I mean? And, and that's not to put that experience down because I bought a lot of great stuff there, but we wanted that really intimate connection where whether it's a hundred people or 500 people, we wanted you to be able to feel welcome and open. So uh, some of the things that we offer, I mean, we have the standard fair. We have, you know, role-playing game sessions and board game sessions that are scheduled. We have Pathfinder Society. We have Greyhawk Reborn. We have Adventures League. Uh, we also have a ton of game designers. Uh, and of course, Vendor Alley. We have a lot of local crafters, a lot of folks, you know, kind of selling their wares. Uh, I think a couple of the unique things that we do is one, we have a kids area uh, that is not just you know, Sunday only, kids day, you know, it's like, no, kids play too. And we want adults to play with their kids and introduce them to this hobby. And we want to show people the variety of games that are out there. So we have a child station that, you know, has all children focused games and we have a bunch set up to kind of attract attention. Uh, and that's up all weekend. We have um, our make a hero station, which has like fabric and masks and things donated from local companies and, and people. So kids can kind of make their own hero identity. And uh, we have a 1600 board game library uh, that we put out. Wow! Uh, yeah, we uh, we've gotten quite a quite a bit of donations over the years from uh, stores, people, and you know the industry has been fabulous for us. Um, so, you know, we have that out all weekend. Uh, one of the things that we do is for our vendor and our uh, playtest area, we actually make that open to the general public, even without a pass. 
so folks can come in and shop and, and treat the vendors. And we just say that if you want to stick around and play anything from the library or whatever, just, you know, get a day pass. If you want to upgrade it to a weekend pass, that's awesome. Um, so those are mo most of the stuff over the regular. Now, what we've added in the last two years is we actually have continuing education approved uh, trainings through National Board for Certified Counselors on therapeutic application of role-playing games. So um, one is a theory course where it basically goes through, you know, why this model works and what it's connected to in terms of, you know, research-driven modalities. But then the second year, we added a course on how to create and implement the content. And we talked about anything from what's the police force look like, you know, in your role-playing world or what's religion, uh, you know, and how to use metaphor and allegory and how, you know, this whole thing is very trope-driven. Um, when, when you talk about, like, what moves me in a movie is the same thing that's going to kind of move me in a role-playing game, so let's use a lot of that. Um, we're actually planning our 301 to add, <clears throat> which is going to be a practicum course, and our goal is to connect therapists <clears throat> with role-playing game designers so they can kind of learn, like, you know, here's your rubric on how to create a one shot, but then we want you and your partners to run that one shot for other therapists. So now you get to see how other people are running these sessions and you get to pick out those therapeutic moments, uh, as well as running like mini sessions and panels and workshops. So uh, every year we have a designer workshop. This past year, we had one that was called Mechanics with Meaning, where we talked about, you know, designers who designed role-playing game systems that spoke not just to like good adventure and good games, but systems and settings that spoke to social change and systems that spoke to, you know, people's experiences and segments that, you know, don't, don't get a lot of attention, but the game's mechanics are designed specifically to help bring those ideas into the forefront. So it's about games promoting change as well as just, hey, this is a fun thing to do on a Friday night, you know. So that, that's a lot of what we, our, our eventual design for SAVE is that we want it to become a conference convention where it's pretty much come for the classes, stay for the games, which is kind of our model for therapists now, where they come for classes on Friday, they play a bunch of games Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday morning, then we get together for a focus group and we share what we've learned and we talk about everything that's uh, going on. So, that, I mean, that's that's our format for SAVE. Um, and it, it's been a, a bunch of fun. We're going to have some word coming up about uh, due to everything with uh, the coronavirus and, uh, and, and the pandemic that we have, uh, we've made the decision, even though we're scheduled out for October, um, we know that it just doesn't feel right to run a physical event that's going to, you know, we're hoping we'll have over 500 people. So we're going to have more news about that soon, about Save Against Fear virtual or technically our 9.5 uh, before we have the formal in-person in 2021. No, sounds uh, that sounds great. And I mean, you know, one thing that you said uh, early on there was, you know, uh, you wanted to have more of an intimate, uh, intimate feel. Um, and and that's that's one thing that you said the other day when we were talking that really stood out to me is, you know, when when you walk into like PAX, you know, for example, um, you know, actually up on up on our YouTube channel. If you guys go to the uh, the playlist that I put up called Bonus Content, you can see the uh, I, I made a quick little video of us walking through PAX this past February, and. Nice. It gets, um, it, it can get a little bit overwhelming. I mean, you, you, you know, there's a, there's a couple shots in there where I'm standing up on like a balcony area and, you know, just looking down into the crowd and the crowd was smaller this year, actually due to the whole coronavirus thing. Uh, there was a few vendors that pulled out and, and all that, but, um, you know, you kind of get this whole overwhelming vibe when you walk in. And from when we were talking the other day, I, I just, you didn't even say that, that you guys are trying to create a more intimate and, and smaller vibe. Um, uh, well, not necessarily smaller, but more intimate vibe. Um, but that was exactly what I, the, the impression that I took away. And uh, I certainly appreciate that, especially for what this con is, is designed to do. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's sensitive to people who do get <clears throat> overwhelmed by crowds. So, I, mean, I, mean, I mean, we were very fortunate when, I mean, when we first started out, we pretty quickly outgrew the game store environment because, you know, we, we were are at that point approaching on like 75 people or so. And we just couldn't fit everybody into the store. So we moved to a Mason's Hall. Then we kind of outgrew the Mason's Hall and we went to a hotel. And then, you know, pricing with hotels is always weird for cons, especially a nonprofit con. Uh, so then we, we lucked into getting an old storefront at a mall. It was an old Boscov store. So department store, we had like 101,000 square feet to play around with. And people were like, we're all in one room. 
And granted, it's a big room, but we have vendors, we have demo agents, we have all this stuff in this one room, but it doesn't feel crowded. And we had, we, we just about, uh, we hit 498 uh, this past year, which was, you know, we went from, I think it was like 150 to what was it 150 to like 207 and then 207 or 213 to like 498 and we were just like oh my god this is like growing exponentially which is what you want but we're always very cognizant about not wanting that big time feel where you know we've turned down a lot of vendors because like the, the infamous aluminum siding vacation package people that you'll see at a lot of these small cons and i'm like no, I'm okay. Uh, I'd rather have an empty booth and people getting hounded, you know, through email six months later. Yep. Uh, but, but one of the rules is that uh, as far as video games, we don't, we don't have video game stations. We don't have, you know, any of that. I mean, vendors can sell video games, but we're, we're very tight on, we have two video game quote unquote presences. One, uh, Extra Life always has a booth for free every year. They're guaranteed in perpetuity. They can put as many video games in their booth as they want because that's how they promote their organization and their events. Uh, and then also the Artemis, which is a large starship simulator, uh, which I was like, well, if you want to get technical, and maybe this is my Star Trek love coming through, I was like, Hell yeah. it's, it's kind of like a LARP with technology because you're taking on the role of Starfleet personnel at your station. So now we're using critical thinking and now we're using communication skills and we're also, you know, talking about partnering, you know, so, so there, whether it was me just using a cheap excuse to have the Artemis at my con uh, or... <laughs> <laughs> but, I've, I've played Artemis a number of times with a, oh, with yes. a group of people. It's a lot of fun. Oh, yes. it's, it's amazing. But, the, but those are the only screens or bleep bloops, as, as I say in my impending old man language, uh, that we have it save. So. And, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, t Tony's actually, Tony's the one that, that uh, introduced me to, uh, to Artemis uh, years and years ago at this point. Um, but, I mean, it's not really, a, I mean, it's not a video game. Yeah, I think if, I'm re if I remember correctly, I think there's a couple quests or whatever in there, at least at the time. It's been years since I've touched it. Might have updated since then um but you're kind of creating your own world and creating your own quests and things with it so i can certainly understand why it would be allowed well and even the people that run the artemis for us like they're actually adding storylines when they do this uh they actually have like uniforms <clears throat> that they dress in when they do it so i mean it is this amazing like cabal you know it's this, it's it's an event uh, in and of itself, but adding the whole like storyline, I had this weird thing in my mind where I'm like, okay, so we have the Modifius Star Trek role playing game. Uh, so why can't we like kind of okay, team? We have this mission. This is coming up, and they'll like actually use the role playing game while you're doing this, and like so many ways to to implement, you know, the the two of those together. But yeah, that that would be amazing. <laughs> now now I get the itch to play Artemis. Tony, Tony, I know what we're doing at some point in the near future. Certainly. <laughs> yeah, that's all cool too. And we actually talk at, at one point, I forget after which episode. It's not something that's aired yet, but just about like some new statistics and the very poorly named no nomophobia, which you know is <laughs> If Nomophobia. The, yeah, if you follow the Latin, it's it should be fear of laws, but because you know it, the way things are named now, it's no mo phones, oh. and they've combined phone and and phobia into a single word, and I know just like total butchering yep. of what it should be called, but uh, but it's it's just a very present thing now, and and especially now that we're you know, all social distance, but even right before it, there, it became, you know, a big issue in schools. Um, and there was a lot of other weird statistics that came up with it. Like somebody like, I'll, I'll forget the age bracket, but the, the people polled a alarming number would rather go without shoes for a week than lose their phone for an hour. Yes, right. Wow. Yeah, and that's you know, like one of the things that you know we discuss. I, and again, I can't recall which which game that we played that we talked about it afterward. But yeah, it was in the wrap up. I think it might have even, it might have been Goblinville. I don't remember, but it was yeah, it was in the wrap up of one of them later on yeah. in the season. I can't recall, but anyway, to the point where you know just just put the phones down is for for a convention and and just you know to have a uh, a good time and because you know immerse yourself in this community and everything like it's, yeah. We're on, we're on board with that as well. 100%. 100%. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. 
you know, says, says the man who looks at his phone like every five seconds, like, did I get a message? Did I get a message? Yeah, I remember yeah. when cell phones were still like, you know, the, what is it, LCD screens with like, you know, Snake was the most advanced game that you had, you know, and, I, and I'm standing there, like, I will never have one of those cell phones. I don't want to get, you know, me, me, me and my young Turk period. And then, you know, now I'm like, you know, I, I go to the kitchen and, I've, and I'm terrified because I don't have my phone. Yep. Whew. I know, I know, and it's like I've got I've got two of them. I've got my personal, I got my personal phone, and I've got my work phone, and they always keep going off. I just, oh man, I just, it's like I just want a break. I just want a break. I want yeah, a break. Just a little. So, yeah. so play a game. Perfect yes. break. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So we at Deeds and Dragons discuss a lot of theory, but you actually practice the melding of therapy and RPGs. What's the difference between therapeutic and clinical? Love, yeah, we, we love that question. Um, the, the, the basic mainline difference that <clears throat> we like to make is that, you know, and this kind of stretches back because, of course, any talk about role playing game has to involve some mention. It's almost like a, a writer in the contract of Satanic Panic. <clears throat> uh, but but way back about a time, you know, when when people talked about you know why role playing games are bad then, and and one of the biggest kind of leaps was escapism. You know, and like, well, you know, people are going to over identify with the character, and then you know we talk about you know Bink Pullings and James Dallas Egbert, and a lot of the you know the 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 uh, the stuff that happened with you know those incidents uh and what the realities behind them were and i can definitely pontificate if you would like i don't know how familiar everyone was with those but the the whole idea of games as therapeutic is that games as escapism aren't aren't dangerous and it's as natural to us as taking vacation or sitting in veg in, in front of the tv for a couple of hours you know the the therapeutic end is we're gaining social connection because no matter how much of an island someone wants to report that they are and how they don't need nobody and i'll get by just on my own we we're social animals we're we're designed from the brain, you know, mirror neurons are one of the most important things that we've discovered in the last number of years where, you know, mirror neurons are that thing where like you take a little baby and that baby, <clears throat> you know, engages in a certain pitch of cry and they see that facial response from the parent or that behavioral response and the mirror neurons are kind of like oh this is how we do this in this situation you know all up to you know you go to a party and steve said he was going to be there but steve didn't show up on time and now you're in a room with people you don't know mirror neurons help you connect with oh that person is is moving in a way or speaking in a way or their tone has a certain resonance that is comforting to me it, it's one of the ways we navigate our environment and gaming stimulates this because without nourishment in terms of input and information our brains will go nuts like it literally that's what happens <clears throat> so games is being therapeutic we separate it from the clinical therapeutic in which uh we're just playing for fun we're playing to escape for a little while we're playing to relax we're playing to kind of get out of our head whereas with the clinical piece of this it is about okay we know that people have fun when they're playing role-playing games or playing a board game. But now if we could select a game or we could augment and change facets of the game, and we do a whole panel presentation on bringing characters to life, which is our little kind of expose about the character sheet. So even just something as simple as your basic bare bones D and D character sheet, you have attributes, which helps a person with self-identity and self-reflection. So what does strength look like to you? How important is strength versus intelligence? What does charisma look like? You know, if I have a person who has a social skills struggle or a person on the autism spectrum who, who experiences their autism through social challenge, what does it mean when I ask that person to play someone with a charisma of 18? What, what does, or, or, you know, even if I'm an awkward teen, what does suave look like to me, right? So <clears throat> when, when we talk about that, that's one layer. Then we go to, now you have your spells and your powers. Well, now we're talking about the use of power and conflict resolution skills. And we're talking about the chain of consequence and reward. So, you know, a risk reward, you know, all these mechanics that can be built in just to the simple fabric of, you know, let's look at the one ring. 
and all of the weird psychological stuff that went on about like, you know, you're hiding it from other people and you're willing to kill for this power, but let's talk about invisibility and what would you do if you could turn invisible? You know, would you just like mess with Aunt B's pie on the windowsill or, you know, would you be stealing the gold out of, you know, the rest of, I'm sorry for the younger listeners, uh, Aunt B, ask your grandparents because that, you know, you might not know who Aunt B is. <clears throat> so, so the clinical aspect of this is, you know, we talk a lot about the perfect marriage between you don't just have to be a good therapist to do this with, with, with good ability. You have to also be a good game master because it's just as much about running a believable, uh, entertaining, engaging, immersive session that draws the player in. Like our, our method, the Bonata model that we're developing, we don't do a lot of like every 15 minutes. And, and again, this is the joke I've told on every podcast, but here you go. You know, you've just slaughtered an entire orc village. How does it make you feel? You know, it's, yeah. you know it, it's not Freud behind a screen, right? It's we're engaged in this adventure and you know, we've had moments where one kid, he kept going through, like, uh, jokingly, he ran room into room, just getting zinged by arrows and constantly healed. And then at one point, he's like, hey, do I have to go rushing through the door? And we're kind of sitting there, like, on the inside, we're like, oh, he's going to have a moment. He's going to have a moment. But we're like, I don't know, do you? And he's like, well, well what else can I do? Ask your party. Hey, what what could I and like they're they're going through this thought process and he goes and literally his partner in the table was like, you can like look through the keyhole or something to see if anyone's in there, <laughs> or, you know, just something other than just rushing through. And literally he sat back and he went, I get it, I get. It. And, and so again, we're playing innocent during the session. We're like, what, what, what do you get, dude? And he goes, I see what you're doing here. What am I doing here? <laughs> you're trying to get me to think about my decisions before I act. So I'm wow. less impulsive. And I go, Hey, if that's what you take from it, that's awesome. I'm just trying not to get you killed because you're running out of potions. So, you know, it's, it's, it, and that's one of the reasons that the name Bodana is, is, it's actually a Sanskrit word that means leading to an awakening or understanding. So the idea, whereas initially it was to try to get people, um, to utilize, you know, Buddhist aspects of, you know, mindfulness practice and being attentive to your intention and what you say and what you do, we, we eventually found that it was even more perfect when we talked about gaming because the whole idea of gaming is, you know, I don't sit down to a Friday night D&D &D going, well, I'm going to learn social skills and meet friends that are going to be in my life forever. You know, that no one comes to a table specifically to do that. But the game does that just because of the simple fabric of, you know, there's no better way to make fast friends than to put four people in a death trap dungeon. <laughs> you know, then all of a sudden you need this other dude or dudette, right? <clears throat> so, so a lot of the, the idea is then we go a little bit further. So what we do is we create characters that inject what the player needs. And, you know, I always also tell a short story about uh, a, a spy named Bert. So, uh, Bert the Spy was a character played by a 10-year-old kid in a group that we ran using No Thank You Evil from uh, Monty Cook Games, Shauna Germain, wonderful designer. Um, and the whole idea was we were running a grief and, lo uh, grief and loss group for kids who had lost a primary parent. And during the group, like we, we created this whole adventure where they basically tried to find the, the grand inventor of Storia, which is the world all the adventures take place in. So their whole idea was he was supposedly kidnapped at the, at the big festival. Well, what actually happened was the inventor knew his time was drawing near and he was not long for days in this world. So, you know, he, he just was going through the world and saying his goodbyes and his thank yous to people and, you know, trying to make sure to fix whatever might still be needed before he left. So they're following him. They're going through all these different worlds. And what we did was we, like, this was the most sadness trope laden thing this side of the first 10 minutes of Up. Like it, it was designed because the, the facilitators at the program that we ran this six week group for said we've run these kids through this grief and loss group that we have is could we use this to test them and I said well absolutely we, it, we they were there they you know they knew the kids better than we did so we created these moments 
that were all about loss and all about grief. So each step of their journey was a storyline. Like my favorite was when we went to Castle Karaoke. And Castle Karaoke was just part of one of the worlds where uh, they, they hold a, a karaoke competition, but it was like a scary thing. So uh, Lucy Medusi, who uh, was the person that they encountered, she had a problem because Lucy wanted to be a performer. She, as a, as, as, as a Medusa, like she wanted to sing, but she could never enact with her audience because, you know, not to steal some, you know, ELO, but, you know, they turned to stone. So... Every, so the party designed glasses for her that would, they were basically googly eyes, but they enabled her to sing to her crowd without turning them to stone. But what we then challenged them with, and bear in mind, these are like, you know, 10 to 14 year old kids. And we ran the game in a game store, which is another thing I'll talk about in a sec. Um, so they invented this and then they, they literally were like, why don't you guys get up on the mic? You can't get your pass to the next land without singing at Castle Karaoke. So after Lucy Medusi went on, uh, then, you know, she had her opening act, uh, NWA, Nagas with Attitude. So it was a bunch of rap <laughs> snake creatures. Um, then they had like a werewolf who sang this dirge about like the moon, how he was in love with it, but it left every month and this pain in his heart and a vampire with no fangs. So how could he drink blood except through a straw? And the kids, then we said, come up with a song that you guys are going to sing. So in a room full of adults, <clears throat> the kids came up with a song about a supposed fifth world of the land of Storia, which was an island chain that got sunk. And they created this song in like 20 minutes and sang it in front of a room of strangers. Wow. Now, even deeper <laughs> was that one of the kids, uh, his, uh, his character name was Bert the Spy. So we knew that Bert was the name of his father. And we thought that he had just kind of done an homage and just named the character after his dad. So we had a part of the adventure where they met the snakes of change and you know the snakes of change talked about you need to shed to grow because you know you can get enclosed with your fear so what do you fear and literally this kid was like i ain't afraid of nothing and so we're sitting there like in our minds our therapist minds are going no -uh, no way like your mom told us what you were afraid of kid but when we asked him after the, the whole thing we said well aren't you afraid of the dark he goes well i am and we went, what? And he said, but that's not me. That's Bert. And I went, but you named Bert after your dad. He goes, no. He goes, I'm playing my dad. And, I, and oh. we just kind of sat back and I went, like literally like, enhance, enhance. You're like, tell me more. And he said, well, I never really got, I never really knew my dad. So I wanted to play as my dad from what my mom told me and what I could remember so I could learn more about my dad. And like, I tell this story wow. at cons and at conferences and in trainings and like, you know, I'm handing out tissues, you know, everybody's like, Oh my God. And yes, it's a beautiful moment. But I said, let's look at this a little bit deeper from a clinical perspective. I didn't tell him to do that. <laughs> we, we said you could put as much of yourself in your character as you want. We're going to do these. Like we, everything was open. The kids knew what we were doing. No, no secrets in therapy. But a 10-year-old child deeply self-injected his character with elements to answer internal questions he had about the loss of his father. That's intentionality. So if, if the, we always say that players will inject into the narrative and into their character what they feel they need based on their level of comfort. If I don't feel that you're going to take me seriously at the table or you're going to inject into this, players won't inject and players will disengage. So it's, it's like any other form of therapy where rapport is the key. So if we're designing the story where it's that true you know, collaborative storytelling that role playing's pinnacle is, that's where the magic happens. Because now we can create a setting 
and and we used blades in the dark for a secondary group for them where there was a whole illicit street drug because all the kids had lost a primary parent due to drug abuse so we created a setting that mirrored their experience which allowed them to express and and to dive into this so it's about exposure it's about rehearsal it's about practice and demonstration those are kind of the four key areas that we believe that role playing games facilitate clinical therapeutic growth and and it's all about how you tell that story and engage that story so I, I i guess there is never a simple answer as to how it does it but i mean those are a couple of examples of of things that we've done um yeah i'm trying to think if there's anything else that expresses it but that but that's kind of really the the meat to this is that if you're running a good game with the correct setting and the correct challenges that that's probably the other big thing is you know if if i have trouble being an, an open speaker or speaking publicly I'm going to make you the Newt Rockney of your party. Like, you're Patton. Here's your silver helmet. There's your flag. Let's come on and rally the troops. Now, if it's a kid who's like, okay, guys, um, like, you know, the king's really unfair, and I don't like the king, so we need to, like, you know, we, we need to take the king down, okay? So who's, who's with me? Yo! You know, if, if that's where the kid's at, then we celebrate the heck out of that because that's a milestone for him. Now, if it's another player who maybe their problem is they're impulsive and they inject too much, like, kind of like that side, you know, sidecar player or that backseat player, then we do things such as the king is like, I don't want to talk to you. I want to talk to him. Well, why do you want to talk with him? Because he's not you. And he's patient, and he's waiting for me to ask him questions. So whenever you're ready, I'll let him speak. I, I'm doing it in character. I mean, it, therapeutically, I'm saying... You're interrupting a little too much, and I'd like to hear from some of the other players at the table. But instead of doing that in that overly authoritative kind of role, we mix even intervention into the narrative, which, again, the immersion, that's where we talk about, we had talked in our conversation on the phone about the concept of bleed. And, you know, one of the things that we say is we either seed the bleed or heed the bleed. So seed the bleed is I want to inject crossover content. I want to plant that seed to make that germinate so it is a moment for that player. Other times we heed the bleed. If it's an area you're not ready to go in, we're going to prevent that crossover as much as we can, uh, which then bleeds over into things like the X card and the lines and veils and the, the VCR and a bunch of the consent mechanics, which, which again, going back to Monty Cook, their book on consent and gaming, it, it, it's phenomenal. <clears throat> yeah, I so think that answered the question. Much. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, it does for sure. And we actually had a, a consent question, uh, which I guess we could just ask now. All right, Tony, can you ask it? I, yeah, like, totally. No, uh, understanding consent <laughs> gaming is uh, is definitely good to upkeep with friends. Uh, but how do you manage the uh, the difficult topics and scenarios in clinical gaming? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, for, I mean, I'm, 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 i give kind of, I guess, a brief, I don't know if you've talked in other episodes about consent tools in general, I don't want to retread ground you've already gone we, over. We have, we haven't, no. You haven't? Okay. So uh, just two basic tools <clears throat> that they use. One of the, one of the most prominent is the X card, which is, uh, you know, it's seen in, uh, card games, like for the queen, there's an actual physical X card. Uh, but it's basically can be as simple as an index card with an X drawn on it or a black Sharpie. And the use of the X card is very simple. If there is con, you know, any kind of content that's within the game that the player finds, you know, objectionable, questionable, disturbing, uncomfortable, whatever, uh, you tap the card, you can push the card forward, you know, that's even part of it where the, t where the team or the group t agrees on how the card exactly could be signaled. Um, it, very big kind of other facet is you don't have to explain why. You don't have to talk about why that content, you know, content was uncomfortable. It's just the fact that you're signaling, I'm not okay. And the group respects that. That, that's a hard and fast rule. Now, Lines and Veils brings a little bit more kind of subtext to it or a little bit uh, of a deeper level where uh, with Lines and Veils, there are lines which you kind of state at the beginning. There is a line through this topic, you know, that and, and you know, a la Yosemite Sam, you know, you, you know, you don't go over that line like that. You don't cross it. So if animal cruelty is a line, you don't go there. Now, veils are a little bit more nuanced where, okay, let's just say, for example, we're playing in the years of gold and old. Let's play, say we're playing gangbusters, right? 
1920s, 30s, criminal gun runners, you know, gun malls, all that fun Al Capone stuff. Crime is in that universe. So to have that as a line might be a little difficult. So maybe it's a veil for someone where I understand that that has to be there. So could we just not make the descriptions garish or, you know, over the top? So, you know, maybe even something like sexual assault. Yes, we know that, you know, slavery, sexual assault, domestic violence, you know, a lot of these things that are common triggers within the fabric of RPG plot. Um, the table pretty much states this is what's cool. This is what's kind of cool. This is what definitely is not cool. And the, again, the game master, and, and this is something that there's been so much discussion on this that, you know, a lot of people are like, well, what if players are just using it to kind of like get out of like a bad botched role? Well, then maybe you're not using it properly. And maybe instead of using it like in the moment, maybe you should ask these questions ahead of time, which is actually something that, you know, at Bodana, we do it multiple different ways. We ask questions on our intake form so the parent can clue us in as to what might be going on or the person themselves. We also have a specialized section within our uh, within our intake form that talks about things like, you know, what kind of media do you like? What characters do you like? What things don't you like? You know, because again, going back to immersion, if I'm not, you know, if I'm running a fantasy system for a sci-fi nut, maybe I'm doing it all wrong and that person's not going to be engaged. Um, this is also one of the reasons why we use tons of different systems. So it, consent is as much as preparing the environment to allow the person to feel comfortable uh, because if the person, again, does not feel comfortable during a session, they're not going to share they're, because they don't feel that their perspective or what is important to them is going to be respected. Now, having said that, and I just kind of used an example of these kids are dealing with loss and grief in these groups that we're talking about and they lost a primary parent due to drug abuse. You're injecting pretty emotional content into that universe. And, you know, we had a couple of kids that, you know, had knees bent to their chest during sessions, kind of like, I don't feel like playing, you know, okay, we understand that you're feeling upset. And would you like to talk separately? Because we had, and, you know, another thing to our model is that we never run with only one person. We always have two facilitators in our sessions for such a reason. So this way, if someone does want to talk, but not in front of the group, they can step into a separate area with that co-facilitator and, you know, talk through what, through what goes on. Uh, but, the, but the idea of consent, I mean, it, it's, it's more than just creating a comfortable space. It's creating that safe clinical atmosphere that you have in any group facilitation. So yeah, we, we believe very strongly in the use of consent mechanics. We're actually, uh, there's a, uh, I could probably get the link to you guys. There's actually a form that uh, was created as a part of the Monty Cook Consent in Gaming where it literally lists common triggers and it uses uh, red, yellow, green as far as comfort levels. So it's something that they even say, hey, as long as you give credit to the source material, create this, it's a Google form. So create it in your own group, have your group members and anonymously send feedback to you. So you'll have these items in a spreadsheet. So when you're you know, constructing your plot, you know not to put giant spiders in, you know, because, you know, someone in your group is very, very not okay with spiders or <clears throat> going to even the, you know, like kind of deeper content. So yeah, the idea of consent in gaming is something that very heavily we utilize, uh, even with a lot of our online stuff right now. I mean, it's a little hard once we've made the, you know, COVID transition to, to virtual session, you know, it's a little more difficult to quote unquote kind of slide a card. But thankfully, when we talk about Zoom and, Roll20 and all of these different platforms, there are whisper functions. So a person can just whisper text to the GM, a big capital X, and that's another way to signal. And then, geez, oh, wait a minute. Well, hold on. We're going to back up for a second. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, you know, let, let's kind of take that back. You know, or if the group's comfortable, the person can say, right here is where I'd like to take us back to. Okay, we could rewrite it. I even had a private example of this in a shadow run session I ran with Animal Cruelty where uh, that was my plot line was this whole thing of, you know, a, a dog fighting ring in, in Shadowrun. And one of my players, a good friend of mine, was very uncomfortable with animal cruelty. So she was like, I, no, I don't want this in my game. And I went, okay, cool. They sell drugs now. Is that cool? All right. My apologies. I didn't realize there will never be an animal cruelty example in their campaign ever. And that was just 
like a for friends game, you know? So it's, it's very important even, you know, and, 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 and I gotta say, and I might, you know, get some heat from people. If you have to write a plot, if your plot has to, and I mean has to contain sexual violence, sexual mistreatment, all of that stuff. If your plot has to, you might want to go back to the creation well, because you can write vibrant creative stories. I mean, Golden Sky Stories is a great game that is completely nonviolent resolution. There is no combat system in the RPG. So you can write stories without harshness, even in something like Conan. Like you could t tell other stories. There's, there's 10 million city stories in the naked city, you know, and this is one of them, you know? So, okay. There's like, uh, tons of millions of other stories you could tell be more creative and engage your players in a different way is is what i would say and i mean you know to, to kind of that point too i mean there's been you know in in some of the games that we played i mean kids on bikes and goblinville um come to mind and i, and I know there was only one combat um combat event in, in Tiny Frontiers, which is actually going to be coming out it's going to be the season finale of uh Deejas and dragons um and you know, there was only one combat event there I know personally, and this is this is just me, but I I tend to gravitate towards the games that are more story driven. Anyway, um, you know, yeah. I I you know, combat's fun. Don't get me wrong. I mean, it's really cool to be you know this giant like really cool, powerful like in uh, in Project Biomotus, for example. Oh, um, you know, love which, you, which Bear. Is, yes, Bear, Bear. Uh, in, in in that in, you know in in the game like Project Biomotus, you know you're this really strong and powerful character, and so being able to like you know utilize these these really cool weapons and, and things that you have, that's cool, um, and I and I appreciate that. But like you go into something like Goblinville, for example, um, I think I think actually in Goblinville. Now that I think about it, we did have a combat event, and it. You know, it was fun. It was against geese, though. Yeah, it was against, it was against a whole bunch of <laughs> and, large. Yeah. Uh, well, ba okay, <laughs> spoilers. It's it's spoilers, but I think we actually had it in the trailer, if I'm not mistaken. They were uh, they were supposedly baby giant death geese. So just just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> but um, but you know even even so, like, and I still en I still enjoyed that. Don't get me wrong, but I enjoyed the the story of Goblinville and everything much more than the combat. So. I think you know to to your point. Obviously, even in a even in a system that does have combat, you can certainly tell a story. A very and Conrad uh, did a, a wonderful job in in most every game that we did. Um, you know that that wasn't combat driven anyway. Um, telling a, a fantastic story that that keeps you uh, you know keeps you engaged. Uh, so I think you can really do that in, in just about any system that. Um, you know, as long as you tell a, a cohesive story, you know? Yeah, well, and, and even, I mean, talking about the the nature of, of violence and combat and stuff like that in role-playing settings, there we go. Uh, one, of, one of the things that I, that I always love talking about also is that, you know, let's look at that example I, I kind of jokingly said earlier about, you know, slaughtering an entire orc village. How does it make you feel? Well, I don't have to directly ask you that question to talk about consequences or reactions. I can build that into the narrative. So now, yes, you've displaced that orc tribe and they're all dead and, and whatever. Well, now let's talk about that orc village that maybe they were also the folks that did all the mining of the ore. So now metal is in scarce supply. So now your weapons are three times as high as they would be. And, you know, it's very simple. Like, why is it so expensive? Was it, you know, you notice the weapons are a little bit more expensive. So now let's talk it through in the shopkeep, you know, it's just like, you know, you, 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 you got to look at it this way. You know, we don't have people going down the mines no more, do we? So I don't have metal. So yeah, if you want weapons, you got to pay. Now, if those orcs were still mining, We'd have tons of money left. You know, you'd to, you could, I'd set up tea cheaper. So I, you know, fire on those people who killed all those orcs. You know, or, or all of a sudden, there's a shanty town because now the displaced village, that village was ransacked, they have no place to go. So now they move into your town, which means all the taverns are full or all the inns are full because, you know, all of this is coming around. So I mean, there are so many ways... And, and I think a lot of people in role-playing games, it's the whole murder hobo, like, you know, people without consequences. There are consequences to this type of behavior. There's reasons people just don't walk around with swords openly, like cutting over, you know, palace guards. It, there are consequences. We still want it to be fun, but we need to realize that, you know, sometimes it kind of goes a little too over the, over the rails. But, 
Yeah, it's just different way of storytelling that I, you know, there's no right way to play, but there are definitely a couple of wrong ways to do it. <laughs> you know, I, I, I do got to say, if this therapy thing doesn't work out for you, you get, you get a career in voice acting. Uh, actually, to, to kind of a lie, one of, uh, one of my absolute secret passions, I am completely enamored of voice acting. I've, I've, been, <clears throat> I've been a fan of voice actors ever since I saw a video of Mel Blanc doing all the voices sitting on an interview chair, and I'm just like, <gasps> you know, so he, I've, I've... Is he the original voice of a lot of the Disney characters? Uh, no, he was uh, the Warner Brothers guy. Warner Brothers. So he was I, okay. Bugs, Daffy, all them. Yep. But I, I've met Rob Paulson and Maurice LaMarche, Billy West. Like I've met all of oh, these, wow. you know, different folks. And even like I, I do a live play called uh, Clinical Role with a bunch of other therapists. And, you know, in that game, this is my character. So he's kind of loosely based on Liam Neeson. I have a particular set of ranger skills. And there's, <laughs> there's always a bigger fish. Um, so yeah, I, I, I love doing voices. It was actually one of the things that helped break my shyness when I was a teen. Cool. Uh, it's also one of the things that got me a lot of trouble when I was in school, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I love accents. I love voices. I love even physical mannerisms. So yeah, just really getting into character. No, nice. No, Cause like, uh, you know, when, again, when, when we were having, uh, having our discussion, uh, the other day, off uh, <laughs> off air, um, you know, we started, I, I brought up the fact as I do quite often that I'm a giant <laughs> wrestling fan. And you went into a you went into a great Stone Cold Steve Austin impression, and ever, <laughs> ever since I've just been like, man, he's he's got it, he's got it. Uh, I've, I've got something, and uh, you know, <laughs> people are gonna wait outside to like clean it up. I guess no. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, we, one of the things that, that we, we, we talked about was, you know, the, the, obviously the differences between therapeutic and, and clinical gaming. Um, you know, what, what does it take to run a directed clinical session as opposed to just your average game for, for your friends? I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's a lot more that goes into it. Uh, a, a lot of it is really the pre the pre planning of of everything. I mean, a, a lot of times in in my private games, I've I've been a very off the cuff kind of D, uh, DM. Um, one of the biggest things is that in addition to our intake document, and we have like a, a pre questionnaire that we ask, which is kind of asking the same questions, but in a more narrative, different way, so it doesn't seem like as antiseptic as a clinical intake form. Um, we also have what we call a therapeutic narrative, uh, narrative arc worksheet, uh, which is literally what we do is we take goal areas that the player has kind of said they want to work on. And what we do is we kind of lay these out on an individual worksheet for each client. Then what we do is we kind of like, you know, conspiracy theorist red string, you know, the stuff where we go, okay, so three members in the group want to work on social anxiety and, the, and they match up this way. So, okay, let's create challenges then for these players, or can we create a nemesis or, you know, and, and we basically break this worksheet to talk about what does the world contain that could do this? What does the plot contain? What does, you know, what do characters other in, like, could we, could we group an impulsive person with a paralysis analysis person as like a, you know, I smell a sitcom, you know, kind of like, you know, the, oh, these two, you know, can, can we do that within the fabric of the game to get people who could maybe learn from each other? while we guide the experience and then even your Oscar and Felix, if you will. I yes, exactly. Do you know that there are words to the odd couple theme song? I did not. I actually did not. And Hogan's heroes. That I did not know either. Yes. I, I am Jack King of useless information. So, you, you know, actually, <laughs> Conrad, Conrad once years ago <laughs> named me the encyclopedia on useless knowledge. Ooh. Yep. We, we need to have a trivia off. I know, would, I know. That would be boss right there. Yes, I'm down with that. I'm down with that. <sighs> Next time um, on the DeejCast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but going even further, we, are, we also use a lot in terms of NPC presence during the game. So a lot of this is kind of prefabbing and constructing. You know, let's say we have a person that's afraid to take a chance and they kind of, you know, so we'll create, you know, like, you know, we'll, we'll create like some kind of character. It's like, yeah, go ahead there. You know, just do it. 
just go ahead and do it. You know, I don't, don't worry about the consequences, lad. Just go ahead and do whatever you want. Doesn't matter to me a stitch. And 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 the person really, yeah, yeah. Or we might go, well, I don't know, Pinocchio. You know, like you know, one of those like Jiminy Cricket kind of conscience characters. <clears throat> but it's about creating those moments and those energies that can push the direction of the story, in a way. And now, granted, there's also a lot that we do on the back end, which is kind of reflective talk. Like, you know, normally, it, and it depends on the needs of the client. Some people we do it once a month. Some people we do it immediately after the session or during our breakdown. Uh, or sometimes we do it every three months where we'll just kind of like, oh, so how you feel about your character? Like, what do you, what do you identify with? Or what don't you identify with with your character? What do you like about them that maybe you would like to like more about yourself or you know so we we do a lot of prefabbing so it's really the planning and always keeping that in your mind yeah i'm running this session and you know what some days we just have a fun session but i still have to remember that i have a professional obligation to the fact that i'm running this for therapeutic benefit and yes fun can be therapeutic but I always have to make sure, and this is why we have like planning meetings in between sessions where we say, okay, so let's talk about what happened last time. What beats hit? You know, what, what story elements did the people gel to? What did they like? What did they not like? What should we put more in? What should we put less in? And even then, that's no different from any other therapeutic group where you run and go, okay, uh, Conrad, tell me something you like, something you didn't like, and something you would change about group. You know, it's a standard group kind of follow-up question. No different from smokes on the back porch or your GM where you're like, oh, so, you know, that, that battle, that conflict with, you know, the nemesis today, that was friggin' awesome. Could we have more of that? We also ask each session at the beginning, so what's everybody remember about last adventure? That's a signal for us as well to learn what was important, what resonated, what was cool. That's more of what the players want. So it's listening to your players, planning for your players, and augmenting the content with an extreme amount of intentionality and a lot of uh, humility as well. Sometimes what I think is cool, you know, I took five hours to design this awesome dungeon, and they want to go to the forest. <laughs> ah! You know, so, so railroads aren't even an option. Like, we've shut down the station at this point because player-directed therapeutic models are going to tell you where the client wants to take it is where you take it. Not that you don't have consequences or limits. I mean, it's a sandbox, but there's still boards on the edge of the sandbox. There's sure. certain things that we shouldn't do. So that, that I'd say is the biggest element to making this clinically relevant is, is making sure to never forget the goals that are at play. Um, because I think one of, one of the other things that Bodana talks about a lot that I don't see a whole host of, or I shouldn't see that, but uh, not everyone talks excessively about, which is using this for social skills treatment is a very, what's the phrase? I don't, it's a very easy grab because of the nature of role-playing games to be a social engagement activity. Like you literally could just run like whatever intro adventure you wanted for people and you would be practicing communication, collaboration, you know, all of that kind of thing. But to inject like work with anxiety or work with depression or work with grief and loss, there's a lot more nuance to that process because you really have to be careful of not over injecting the content and like, you know, proselytizing to the client. But at the same time, you don't want to make it, it's, oh, it's just for funsies and it's whatever we want to do. Because no, there's a purpose and a design. So it's a really careful line that you have to skirt because I've had so many professionals say, well, how do I do this? therapeutic gaming thing and I go well first of all don't call it a thing that you know kind of, yeah <clears throat> but I think he even told you on the phone the story of you know someone had contacted us and said so where do I find the therapeutic gaming modules and I go uh, you tell me I, I don't see my Barnes and Noble uh, but I answer I said we create our adventures like we we custom build every group gets a custom adventure even if it's like three months down the road you know it's it we don't replicate we don't repeat even from group to group, I think the only, even with the research study that we're doing, like we're using the same setting, but the rumors, because you guys have run kids on bikes, you know, the rumors and the powered ally and all that stuff, <clears throat> where the adventure goes is up to the group, but how we set it up, yes, they're all operating from the same town. They're, you know, the, so the locations are the same, but what they do with it, 
that's what we need to know because what you do with it is what it means to you and what it means to you tells me more about you. So, so, uh, so like, I know you guys are talking, um, or, or sorry, you were talking about, um, you know, a, a, an intake form that you had like with, with parents, um, mm-hmm. you know, when they, when they bring the, you know, bring their kids in. Um, so do you, do you then take what's on the intake form and then tailor the story? I'm assuming it's used and tailor the story to the, to the individuals that are going to be part of that group? Oh, absolutely. Like we, one of the, just for example, we, we run a group for an agency. <clears throat> I can't name the agency, uh, but it, it's a transitional age population. So it's like teenagers going into the adult world. They're transitioning between those systems. And when we had kind of asked everybody survey and done their intake, everyone like was exhibiting like, you know, social anxiety or, you know, feelings of judgment and, you know, people judging me without really knowing me. So we're all kind of like sitting there and like, all right, what can we do? What can we do? Um, so we said, okay, hold. So everybody is talking about kind of, you know, kind of being on the outside, on the fringes of society. Okay. So that immediately says criminals. They're all teenagers. So then we said, okay, so criminals, outskirts of society, what can we do? Oh, let's make them all, they've all been arrested in the D&D world. So we then kind of set it up as a hodgepodge of X-Men meets Suicide Squad. So okay. they're all kind of outcasts. They're all kind of weird. And literally at this point, we we were like, whatever character you want to play, just go for it. Like we we were kind of, it was our first RPG. So we're like, go, just go nuts with it. What, whatever you want to do. So we had like a, a strider, a half vampire, like, like, like we had just such a weird character thing. But it was, it was interesting because when we started the adventure, we had them all on a tavern. <clears throat> like you do. And everyone because they were all playing like these social outsider characters everyone was like my character is enveloped in the shadows i'm sitting in the corner of the table soaking in the darkness to hide me from everyone's eye so we described like that's a very uncomfortable corner of that table because all eight of you seem to be trying to like huddle in with each other. So like, it's, you know, you have a lot of table left. It's okay. Uh, but, but what eventually happened is we kind of then kind of extrapolated more in the X-Men thing where the tavern was an exercise. So we started, of course, giant rats and it eventually, as it does erupted into a fire that burned it down. And as players are jumping out of the window, we were kind of like, we'll get right back to you. I run out the front door. We'll get right back to you. So, we then kind of melded and we said the cloud and the haze and the smoke of the burning tavern fades away to oblivion. As you now realize you are in that old familiar location surrounded by four stone walls and standing atop the four stone walls are about 16 major high level illusionists. So we created a D and D danger room <clears throat> and then awesome. they were explained awesome. that their whole idea was this corrupt mayor or, and working in conjunction with the prison, we need you to kind of spy on my enemies and do jobs for me, but you're outcast. So, you know, we played on, on the whole idea and we said, your character is in prison. What they're in prison for is completely up to you. Make it up. But more importantly, what are they in jail for? How long have they been there? Did they do it? And how does your character feel about being in prison? So we were addressing some of those questions of, Society has an impression of you as a con where you're accused of something you didn't do, just like you may be accused of certain behaviors or certain character flaws that may not be accurate. You know, it's not that I'm, it's not that I'm antisocial. It's that maybe I'm afraid to engage with people. And we had a lot of very deep meaning with that group. So that's just kind of one of the ways that we, we literally took everybody's sheet and we, we kind of sat at a table and it was like a writer's room meeting where we just kind of all sat together and we said, so what can we throw in there that might be this or might be that? And then we, we review those periodically because typically we try to write in three-month arcs. So mm-hmm. this way, quarterly, we can review the goals a little bit more studiously. But then we offer the uh, option at the six-month mark to say, does everybody still enjoy the game that we're playing right now? Because <clears throat> at this point, you know, we have like – you know, six months for us, that's like 24 sessions. You know, it's a pretty good arc. It's right. like 24 episodes of a TV show, right? So we then give the option, do you want to switch systems? Do you want to stick with this system and just continue where we are? Do you want to say five years? And even how we answer that question 
is like, okay, it's five years from now. What's happened to your character in that time? This also gives us a reflective question of how has your character changed, i.e. how have you changed? You know, because when we all make characters, you ask yourselves, what character did you play when you were 12 versus what character did you play when you're in your 30s? I guarantee your younger characters are simple wish fulfillment, simple I want to play a powerful person because I don't have power. Like that, the, that's a very simple, you know, even me, my, my Marvel character, actually weird story, the character I played from... Ghostbusters, my first ever role-playing game, to Marvel, he literally, John Airedale, has made his way into every role-playing game system as the head of Airedale Enterprises. And when I play Cthulhu in the 20s, it's Thomas Airedale, his grandson, or his grandfather. And when I play it in the future, then it's also Thomas, who is the head of a corporation in Shadowrun. And I got very lucky when I played Pugmire because the last names in Pugmire are dog breeds, so... Hey, Airedale's back. You know what I mean? But yeah. So, so it's, again, it's that creativity that's really fun and challenging as a therapist to, to inject and put that content in there meaningfully in a way that also makes for an engaging game. But it's an integral part to it. You have to revisit that so you don't fall off the beaten path. All right. And before we wrap up this episode of the DeejCast, I want to once again thank Jack so very much for all of his time today. You know, going into this interview, I, I only expected it to last about an hour, hour and a half. Uh, we started at 1.30 in the afternoon. And before we knew it, it was 5 o'clock at night. Uh, so needless to say, folks, I broke this up into a two-part interview. Uh, we started your week off with part one of our incredible talk with Jack Birkenstock of the Bodana Group. And we're going to keep the, keep the DJery coming all week long. On Wednesday, look for part two of this very interview. Uh, and then on Friday, part three of our Shattered series is going to be dropping on YouTube on uh, this very channel, if you're listening to me on our YouTube channel. If not, go over there and hey, you'll see it. And then on Saturday, back here on the DeejCast, we'll be talking to Lost from It's Never Dark Enough, the makers of Shattered. They'll be talking about our gameplay for the episode you watched the day before. And if you're a wrestling fan and you just so happen to like the sound of my voice, search for the PW Torch Daily Cast in your favorite podcast app and listen to me every Thursday on the Daily Cast's PWT Talks NXT, where I talk shop with Kelly Wells and Tom Stout about this week's episode of WWE's NXT product. For the DeejCast, I'm Nate Lindbergh. You can follow me all over social media at Nate Lindbergh. Follow our brand on social media at DeejTime. That's D-E-G-E-T-I-M-E. And we will see you right back here for the continuation of our talk with Jack Birkenstock in just a few days. Take care.